Let me start off with a question. Show of hands, who likes to argue? <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. Well, can you imagine yourself on stage with hundreds of people in the audience with all eyes upon you? <laughs> I can see the look of terror in your eyes already. Actually, it's not that difficult. Because once you master some of the basic techniques, it's actually quite a bit of fun. At least I found it to be a lot of fun. And since you're all Toastmasters, you have already mastered some of the most difficult techniques. For example, like standing on a stage with all eyes upon you. All televised eyes like we have now. You would be surprised how few politicians have mastered that basic technique. You know, there are many innumerable things innumerable things that you can do to prepare for a debate. Some of them are obvious, like getting a good night's sleep, arriving early, bringing a pen and paper if there's a lectern, and of course there's always practice, practice, practice. Some things about debate preparation are less obvious, like not bringing notes. You should already know your stand's cold. And besides, you can look disorganized and unprepared if you're fumbling through your notes all the time looking for an answer. You should also bring along a sidekick. That way, it's somebody who can run out to the car and get something you forgot, somebody who can discuss last minute details with the debate organizer, while you sit back and relax and wait for the big event. Another less obvious trick is to bring two cars. That way, if one has a flat tire, breaks down, or some other trouble, you could still make it to the debate on time. And that removes one more worry, and you could just sit back and relax. So there you are at the debate. It's a scene of orchestrated bedlam, believe you me. But all you need to do is just sit to the side and watch. Because you got there early, your sidekick is taking care of the details, and your only job is to stand wherever it is they tell you to stand. And no matter what happens around you, smile! Because you never know when a camera is focused on you. <laughs> Finally, the big moment arrives. Lights, camera, action! Well, what sort of action can you expect at a debate? Probably the most important aspect of any debate is you can expect everything to be timed. Now, where did you learn how to practice timing speeches, huh? It's very important in a debate to stay within time limits because if you run over time, they cut out your microphone It's embarrassing to say the least when suddenly you're cut off. And another thing important is remember to look at your opponent when they're talking. Because you never know when the camera will be on you and you want to look respectful, like you're paying attention. Believe it or not, that scores a very subtle point with voters. And we already know that politicians are notoriously, notoriously unrespectful. Where was I? Oh yeah. Debates. Most debates have the same overall format. They have opening statements, answering questions from the moderator, and closing statements. Sometimes they, they may cut out one or the other or abbreviate one, but generally speaking, those three pieces are the ones that are there. Let me discuss each one in somewhat of a sequence. Opening statement. You should always, always begin with thanking your hosts. It's odd, but not everybody does that. So you'll stand out if you thank your host. People are going to say, well, he didn't thank them. And you, it's funny to see people come after you because they're not really sure the name of the organization that hosted it. It's pretty funny. So stand out. Surprise people. Be polite. You know, some people use their openings to introduce themselves or maybe give an overview of their positions or tell some cutesy story to help bond with the voters. Nah, none of that for me. After I thank the hosts, what I do is I talk about my opponents. I thank them, too, for taking the interest and the time to run. It takes a lot to run. But then I lay out what I call landmines. I talk about the things that I know they're going to say, because I've researched them. Now, not in detail, but just in general. Because what I want to do is I want to short-circuit what they're going to say before they say it. For example, I'll say something like, oh, well, during tonight's debate, Please listen to my opponents. Listen to how they have a plan to spend your money on things they think are important. I think you should decide how to spend your money, not some politician or other special interest. It sets the stage. And then during the debate, 
I'll make a note of every time they step on one of these landmines because you're going to need that for your closing statement. You have several landmines in the beginning. Lay as many of them as you can given the time constraints that you have. But always, always try and end on a positive note. Especially on something that nobody will disagree with. For example, my standard ending, I always end with the same line. I believe that you have the right to live your life your way without interference, provided only you respect the rights and property of others. It's a political golden rule. Virtually everybody agrees with that statement, which, by the way, is my personal signature line. You should have your own signature line, a slogan, a motto, some central theme, whatever, and it should always, always come at the end of every speech you ever give. It's what you want voters to remember you for. It's what they want to associate with you. Now, speaking of the end of your speech, let's talk about your closing statement before the questions. Because it's very similar to your opening speech. Matter of fact, it should be a duplicate, pretty much, of your opening speech. That means you're going to start off by thanking your hosts again for hosting the debate. Then, one by one, you go through your landmines. And I'll say things like, for example, Note how my opponent only spoke about he plans to spend your money, where my plan was to let you decide for yourself where is best. There are really only two choices in this election, your life their way or your life your way. Pretty good. You took notes, remember? Whenever they stepped on one of your landmines, it's the closing where you get to use those landmines to help highlight the differences between you and your opponents. And finally, just like your opening statement, end with your signature line, signature, motto, central theme, whatever you want people to remember about you, and then close the sale. The final sentence should be, so please vote for me, Ken Krawchuk, dog catcher in Abington Township. It's what you want them to remember about you. So now we've covered the opening and closing statements. What about the questions? Well, you answer them, of course. I don't think I'm really alone in this, but I really dislike how politicians dodge answering questions. So don't dodge. You'll stand out. What I do is I always begin any answer with a brief one-sentence reply, one-word reply if possible. And if that were the only thing I'd be allowed to say, I'd get my answer out. For example, if they ask, do you think we should, ah, whatever, my answer always begins with a simple yes or no. Then I explain why. That way voters know immediately where you stand. Yes, they may disagree with you, but then somebody's always going to disagree with you. Your goal is to show leadership and integrity, which is rare in politics these days. In fact, I've had reporters tell me how different I am because I actually answer questions. Unusual. Now, there's one unintuitive thing about debates. You really are not there to debate. Instead, you're there to talk directly to the voters. So whenever answering any question, spend as little time as possible talking about your opponents. In fact, don't even mention them by name. Save mention for them through your closing statement. Instead, spend your time talking about your vision when you get elected. Another trick I like to use is not spend all my time. They always give you a one minute, two minutes to answer a question. And since most debates don't allow you to answer your opponents directly, you need to make the time to do that. That's why I keep my answers short and to the point, because that gives me extra time to go back and do a rebuttal to something they said before. I can use that extra time even to ask myself a question that hasn't even been asked yet. I've actually done that on national television. Remember, the purpose of a debate is to give a pipe, you a pipeline directly to the voters, and you use that as best you can. Ignore your opponents. There's a lot more I could say about debates. Boy, I can go on until that paddle comes up. For example, let's talk about subjective words. Words that don't really mean anything, or they mean different things to different people. Words like better, improved, happier. Your first question in response to any of those relative words should be, in whose opinion? It's likely not going to be your opinion, and that is going to form the basis of your response when you go to your closing statement. Another thing to watch for are logical fallacies. Fallacies are things that sound true, but aren't. For example, my favorite was told by a musician friend of mine. He says, God is love, love is blind, Stevie Wonder is blind, therefore Stevie Wonder is God. Well, I bet Stevie Wonder is a great musician, but still it's a fallacy. 
It's difficult always to rec recognize these logical fallacies, and the only way you can know them is to study them, and then restudy them every couple of months to stay on your game. There are innumerable websites out on the that will tell you about the logical fallacies. Review them, use them, because they're the ones that are actually going to help you to spot all those relative terms and all of those all those misarguments that they make all the time. All right, let me sum up first. Surely I'm going to go on all day. Number one, always, always be polite. Thank your hosts. Thank your opponents. And actually answer some questions. Be bold. Remember that debates are not debates. They are your opportunity to present your vision to the voters. And always, always, always remember to smile, smile, smile because you never know when that camera is upon you. You're a Toastmaster, remember. These are the sorts of things that we were trained to do. And win or lose, there is no debate that you, you personally, can have an impact on political discourse. All you need to do is take that training, get up, and to quote Nike, just do it. As Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change you want to see in the world. I leave the rest up to you. Madam Toastmaster.